Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Poetry. In today's video, we're going to be looking at a short poem by D.H. Lawrence called Piano. Uh, D.H. Lawrence was an incredibly interesting writer of the 20th century, very, very famous now. At the time of his writing, people were a little bit shocked and scandalised by some of the content, particularly some of his novels, um, which led to not only his books being banished, but him actually becoming exiled from the country. I'd really recommend you go and have a little look at his life because it is very interesting. Now, this poem is all about childhood memories and how a moment in the present can draw you back into your past. There are a number of different interpretations when looking at this poem, but I want you guys to really make up your mind. Central to one of the interpretations that I like is the fact that D.H. Lawrence had a very, very complicated relationship with his mother, something that is perhaps expressed in a very famous book that he wrote called Sons and Lovers, which immediately might make you feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, and I think that this poem is about the idea of going back into your memories and being conflicted by the nostalgia and the kind of beauty of the past, but also the reluctance to go back to a time where perhaps your life was somewhat controlled um, or somewhat difficult. That's how I read this poem, but let's see what you think. Please feel free to let me know in the comments. You might have a totally different viewpoint to me. On another note, before we get started, oh, it would be lovely if you could subscribe to my channel. Super, super helpful for me, but also uh, it will give you the chance to get notifications when the next videos are available for you. Without further ado, let's get started annotating this poem. Our title here, Piano, is obviously very brief. Just a, a one word title, not the piano, not a piano, just piano which shows us something about the significance of the piano to um, D.H. Lawrence's life and the idea significance in his memories. It's like the sort of central idea of the poem expressed incredibly succinctly in the title. Let's have a little look at this, the opening of the poem. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me. So let's talk about a couple of things the first thing that we need to recognize is that we are in the present yeah we are using present tense so he's writing about a moment in time that is present if you have a little look first off at this adverb of manner softly it sets a tone doesn't it it's a kind of calm and a sort of tranquil tone if you look at setting we're in the dusk so you know, that kind of early evening with darkness setting in. And the fact that a woman is singing to him, to me, makes it feel very personal. To me, this moment feels quite romantic. I think it is, there are a few different ways of interpreting this, this poem. Um, but I think that certainly this opening, this is a kind of a, a romantic moment. It's a moment potentially between D.H. Lawrence and a woman he is interested in or, or, or a lover. There's a sort of sense of mystery in that it's a woman. Like it's not clear who the woman is. But the fact that she is singing to him, I think, is what creates a sense of romance. It's not that he's just in a bar and a woman is singing. <coughs> But this has quite an impact on him because it's taking me back down into the vista of years. So we've got this metaphor here uh, because a vista is a view. So it's almost like his um, past is like a, a landscape that he is observing through listening to this woman singing at the piano. But there is a little hint of negativity in the idea that he's being taken back down that suggests that he has had to work his way out from the past so he has had to sort of yeah work up uh from the past now obviously dh lawrence had a very interesting life and he had a very complicated relationship um, with his family, with his mother in particular, so there is perhaps a hint of that difficulty. But it takes him back down the vista of years until I see 
a child sitting under the piano. We can assume that this is him, okay? A child sitting under the piano. So this is quite a sort of sweet image. Um, it's certainly very nostalgic in this moment. Nostalgia presented here. And then look at what we've got. So a child sitting under the piano in, so he's like caught up in, yeah? The boom of the tingling strings. What lovely onomatopoeia, yeah? Both words. But notice there's a kind of juxtaposition here, isn't there? Because um, boom suggests volume. Whereas tingling is quite a delicate sound. It's perfect to describe the piano because, of course, the piano can create such volume, but through these very kind of thin, small strings. So he's caught up in this memory and being in this volume um, of the tingling strings and pressing the small poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. So note here, pressing the small, this is him, so he is playing, yeah? And as his um, mother um, is pressing the pedals of the feet, he, uh, of the piano, sorry, he is sort of pressing her feet in turn. Again, I think we can assume this is his mother. So this is quite a kind of positive memory, a kind of playful, memory of childhood. Um, again, we've got a little bit of phonetic kind of play here. We've got lots of sort of sibilant sounds, um, which, you know, is very kind of soft, quite tranquil again, quite musical. So, start off in the present, quite romantic, travels back in past, slight hint of darkness, but generally a very happy memory. Second stanza, <coughs> excuse my cough, in spite of myself, the insidious mastery of song betrays me back. Now, suddenly we have got language that connotes uh, quite a lot of negativity and darkness. OK, so we get the idea that in spite of myself, it's like he doesn't want to reflect. And check out this adjective, the insidious mastery of song. The insidious means um, harmful, but in quite a sort of gradual way. Um, so this, it's like this developing harm and the develop, developing harm betrays him to the past. Okay, so the back means to the past. Note the personification, yeah? The music is betraying him taking him to a place he doesn't want to go until the heart of me weeps. So again, we've got this personification. It's moved away from simple nostalgia. Now there is sorrow, yeah? And what he wants is to, to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cosy parlour. So note the juxtaposition in setting. Um, again, this is all about um, the comfort of the past. But despite how comfortable the past is, he, he doesn't want to be in it. It's so conflicted because he's saying, don't betray me, don't make me go back there. But when he starts going back there, he wants to stay there because he's weeping to belong to it. Yeah, where the tinkling piano, again, a bit more onomatopoeia. I'm just shortening that to ono. I hope that's okay. The tinkling piano, our guide. So here, the piano is personified. So this comes back to the title of the poem, this idea that the piano is the, the strongest force, the, the, the guiding force, okay? So this is back to a kind of happier time. And note that also his mother is associated with the piano, which is quite important. 
Okay, cokes. Moving on to the third and final stanza. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamour with the great piano appassionato. So hang on a minute, we're back into the present, aren't we? Yeah, we're back to the original woman, the romantic place. But notice it no longer feels romantic in tone. Delving into the past has meant that he is no longer able to connect and feel this comfort from the soft dusk. In fact, now it is vain, so it's like it's pointless, yeah? For the singer to burst into clamour, note the volume being created. It's sort of jarring with his memories. With the great black piano appassionato, this means impassioned, yeah? So it's at this moment, the, the singer who was playing so softly and singing so softly has now kind of created this volume passionate song, but he can't engage with it. He says, the glamour of childish days is upon me. Now this noun is interesting because the glamour can mean beauty, but it can also mean trick. So there's something almost like maybe deceitful in the memory that actually it wasn't really that great. So the glamour of childish days upon me, my manhood, okay, so that is past, this is present, my manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. So he's this metaphor here, it's again, it's this idea of the present hymn is taken over by memories, meaning that he weeps like a child for the past. So this simile is again, it's this sort of desperation to return. Now, like I said before, there is a lot of conf conflict here. Some people read this moment as potentially quite sexual and sensual in tone. Okay, I'm going to put that with a question mark because this is for you to decide. Because like I said, there are different ways of um, interpreting this. You can just read this as someone who is connecting with his memories and therefore struggling to then reconnect to the present time. But if this was something romantic and sexual, then actually this would make sense because it would it would suggest that he's not able to engage with a adult woman as an adult man because he's so lost in this idea of being a child and in this moment it means that he sort of wants to be back there he doesn't want to be in this sort of more adult situation that is possibly made more kind of powerful when again you consider um the interesting and potential potentially difficult relationship that he had with his mother which perhaps you might even border on inappropriate relationship with his mother and there was certainly a lot of kind of codependence um which is reflected in some of the books that he read like um uh, sons, uh, sons and mothers for example um that would make sense because it makes sense of all of the idea about being betrayed back to the past because if he's needed to sort of escape that kind of difficult close relationship with his mother and work his way out when he then engages with another woman if he then starts thinking about his mother that's going to make it difficult for him to engage in that way um that's a sort of slightly more a-levely i suppose approach to this poem um, and you can very happily write a very strong response just sticking with the idea of someone getting caught in childhood memories. There's no problem with that. I want to talk to you quickly about form before we finish up here. Um, so I'll just make a little note down here. Um, just check that you can see that. Sorry about my handwriting there. Um, so form, this is called uh, a lyric poem, okay? Um, and what we have here is we've got three quatrains, um, which means 
stanzas with four lines, quattro, yeah? And what we have is a series of rhyming couplets, yeah? So, or you could say a series of rhyming couplets, or you could say it is an A, A, B, B rhyme scheme. Now, this, there is a very easy way of discussing this. You could literally say that this form of the lyric poem with the rhyming couplets is uh, representing the music being played. Yeah, because this is a poem about piano music and how that creates ideas from the past. Um, so that's a very, very easy way of doing it, because, of course, whenever you talk about form, you have to explain why it's there. But if you want it to be a little bit, you know, more, more kind of um, subtle in your analysis of form, you could look at the number of times that the enjambement breaks the rhyme scheme. Because when you actually read this poem aloud, you don't read it necessarily in its rhyming couplets because so many of the thoughts are carried on like you know look at this one so now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black piano appassionato caesura so you pause there don't you and then you say the glamour of childish days is upon me my manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance you don't say so now it is vain for the singer to burst in clamor with the great black piano appassionato the glamour of child do you see what to I me mean? you don't stick to the rhyme scheme in the way that you read it. So if you look at the moments where the enjambment breaks that rhyme scheme, I think this is all about the kind of unpredictability of memories and the spontaneity of memories and music. I think that's a slightly more interesting way of looking at the form. But again, easy version, you can do well with that. Slightly harder version. Right, hope that was helpful to you. Um, any questions, just pop them in the uh, comments and I will get back to you. Um, if you're revising for your um, IGCSE exam, the very, very best of luck to you. Um, otherwise, that's it from me. Subscribe if you haven't already, please, please, please. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. Happy revising.